in a Nobody else feels like me. Alright. Good morning and welcome everybody to the Crypto Mining Show, your one-stop shop for all cryptocurrency news from the perspective of a cryptocurrency miner. I go by Blind Run on the internet and Matthew in real life, and I've been out at the farm all weekend getting everything swapped over into Octo Miner, so be sure you go check out those vlogs for more information. Today, we have some really interesting news. The Texas GOP is proposing to enshrine cryptocurrency into the state's constitution, making it a right of the citizens of Texas to own cryptocurrency. That's pretty cool. Also, we're going to be talking about the Bitcoin drop, even though we're supposed to have a calm Fed decision approaching as far as the BPS hikes and all that. So I don't know what's going on there, but we're going to talk about it. Crypto lender BlockFi had $1.8 billion in loans at the end of June and $600 million of exposure. Be careful there. How attackers stole around $1.1 million worth of tokens from a decentralized music project called Audis that has been basically like talked up, I suppose, by Bank of America, oddly enough. Not the hack itself, but the platform was talked up about by Bank of America, even though the hack happened. Odd stuff. Minecraft released a blog on their opinions surrounding NFTs, so we're going to talk about that. The implementation of Plasma, we already covered it, but it is now up and running on GetBlock, and so we'll cover it again, let you guys know that it is up and running. And then we have a new coin added to Miner Pool. What coin is it? Well, you'll find out right after a word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Crypto.com. Crypto.com is my go-to centralized exchange for liquidating my crypto assets. With their Crypto.com Visa debit card, I can load up my mined Ethereum to pay for power and other operating costs quickly while earning up to 8% cash back. In addition to the Visa debit card, there are additional fiat options, including wire transfers to easily receive your profits. Crypto.com also offers additional services, including trading and even staking to earn additional revenue on your investments. Join 10 million plus users buying and selling 100 plus cryptocurrencies at true cost by using my affiliate link in the description for a $25 funding bonus or enter referral code SOAT at sign up for the same bonus. Remember, cryptocurrency investment comes with significant risks, so do your own research. All right, so I've not heard from my crypto.com rep yet at this point, so I'm adding to my to-do list to just change that one line in this particular pre-roll from 8% to 5% cash back so that it is accurate, at least from that perspective. That being said, the first things first today, we have Firo added to Miner Pool, of all things. I, I didn't see this one coming. Maybe some of you all saw it coming, but I didn't really see this one coming. Why? Well, because Firo's made a lot of monetary policy changes that have negatively affected miners in particular. At least that's how it appeared. Of course, moving forward, we saw a pretty big price bump in the price of Firo, and that kind of brought the mining profitability back up for the coin in general. So the discussion has been, do miners during a bear market at the very least only basically mine and then liquidate? And I think that that is kind of what a lot of people in the industry are seeing. So we saw this, of course, with Bitcoin here recently and all of the miners having to liquidate their Bitcoin, which is putting a ton of selling pressure on Bitcoin. We also saw it at smaller levels with Aneta and Ergo when basically they added the Aneta smart pool. Essentially, all the uh, the Aneta price on Ergo took a dip, even though it stayed, you know, relatively high over on CNeta. So the demand from miners to mine a coin is resulting in liquidation, which is driving prices down because of the selling pressure. And it affects coins differently depending on how large or small those coins are. It's an interesting discussion to have. And I'd like to hear your thoughts in, of course, the live chat as well as the comment section below, because a lot of us are miners and 
being self-aware of this fact, I think is important. Now, GetBlock did release their, basically their overview of Plasma. We're gonna cover it again, just a little bit shorter because it is now live and ready to go. But on the 20th, they did announce the implementation of it. And just to give you guys an idea, get you caught up, what is Plasma? Plasma is a scaling solution that uses data structures called AVL trees to efficiently compress large pieces of data and post them on the blockchain. By leveraging smart contracts, Plasma can be used to create secure, transparent protocols that use data compression to increase speed and throughput. In the context of GetBlock, Plasma will be implemented in order to store huge amounts of information required for the smart pool to function. The Plasma contracts are designed to hold thousands of miners at once while paying out hundreds within a single transaction. They also ensure the security of the miner funds in a way that is completely transparent and on-chain. The implementation of Plasma will ensure readiness for what's to come to Ergo once the Ethereum merge is in place. Why did they need to do this? Well, previously the way they were doing it is they could only really send out 10 transactions at a time for any smart pool that was tied to a token. So a Neta, for example, Comet, ErgoPad, etc. And this caused obvious pain points for the miners as they weren't clear when they were getting paid out or if the pool was functioning. And then they would hop off, especially when they hit, you know, a thousand miners on the Neta BTC pool. And basically they wanted to find a way to fix it. And it's this scaling solution, which is called Plasma. I think it's super relevant. And I think Ergo and GetBlock moving forward are looking very, very good, at least from my perspective. Now we have a really interesting post here coming from Mojang and it's Minecraft's look at NFTs. Now this one is pretty controversial and that is because you know obviously the nft community is very upset when people don't like nfts for whatever reason let's find out why mojang apparently doesn't like nfts and then we'll kind of discuss so minecraft and nfts an early look at our upcoming guidelines and this is going to impact a lot of stuff including of course neoxa i think at the end of the day because neoxa like like you guys may have seen, have that play to earn uh, portion within them. And they are planning on releasing a Minecraft server for play to earn, but you aren't earning NFTs. So it's a little weird. You're earning a currency. I wonder how that will be affected. It's just a note that I had in my head surrounding it. They say, hello everyone. Recently we've been, we've received some feedback from members of the community asking for clarification and transparency regarding Mojang Studios and Minecraft's position on NFTs and blockchain. While we are in the process of upgrading our Minecraft usage guidelines to offer more precise guidance on new technologies, we wanted to take the opportunity to share our view that integration of NFTs with Minecraft are generally not something we support or allow. Let's have a closer look. An NFT is a unique non-editable digital token that is part of a blockchain and often purchased with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. An NFT can be associated with any form of digital asset, such as an MPEG or a GIF. But the most common use case today is digital art like JPEGs. The purchase of an NFT provides the token that states the ownership of the original digital file. Yet with any digital file, that file can be copied, moved, or even deleted. NFTs and blockchain have also been associated with speculation where prices are driven up rapidly, and as we have recently seen, may fall rapidly. If you're a player or a creator actively involved in buying, selling, or trading NFTs that make use of Minecraft, like skins or worlds, we strongly suggest you go through the information below. Otherwise, it's likely these changes won't affect you. Yes, we are leading up to them basically saying that they are going to crack down on NFTs within Minecraft servers and probably blockchain as a whole. In our Minecraft usage guidelines, we outline how a server owner can change or charge for access. 
and that all players should have access to the same functionality. We have these rules to ensure that Minecraft remains a community where everyone has access to the same content. NFTs, however, can create models of scarcity and exclusion that conflict with our guidelines and the spirit of Minecraft. What are they saying, essentially? They're saying that because of the nature of NFTs, this is actually kind of contradictory, which is funny, okay? We're gonna go over this really quickly because in one portion of this, they say with any digital file, that, that can be copied, moved, or even deleted, meaning that they're saying essentially, you know, the actual NFT ownership of this doesn't matter because it could just be copied or deleted, but then they follow that up with artificial scarcity of these items. So right in this post, I will just go ahead and call out that, that conflict right there and that inconsistency with their argument. So let's continue. Uh, NFTs, however, can create the models of scarcity and uh, exclusion. To ensure that Minecraft players have a safe and inclusive experience, blockchain technologies are not permitted to be integrated inside our client and server applications. It's all blockchain technologies. This does mean that it does affect the Neox, the server that it play to earn server that is coming out the way I read this. And that is going to be important for that team because they don't want to get them themselves caught up in some sort of legal issue nor may minecraft in-game content such as world skins persona items or other mods be utilized by blockchain technology to create a scarce digital asset our reasons are as follows some companies have recently launched nft implementations that are associated with minecraft worlds files and skin packs other examples of how nfts and blockchains could be utilized with minecraft include creating minecraft collectible NFTs, allowing players to earn NFTs through activities performed on a server. Yeah, that is exactly what Neoxa is doing. Or earning Minecraft NFT rewards for activities outside the game. Each of these uses of NFTs and other blockchain technologies creates a digital ownership based on scarcity and exclusion, which is not aligned with Minecraft values or creative inclusion in playing together. Now, on that note, I do want to bring this up because this is my personal view from the perspective of a gamer. I do not like microtransactions. I do not like digital skins that I have to purchase. I do not like play to earn, play to win type games because I feel like it takes away from the experience. If I go into a game, for example, like World of Warcraft back in the day in World of Warcraft vanilla, if I ran around and saw a guy with a really cool mount or really cool gear, I knew that he played that game and earned that mount and gear. Nowadays, you hop into a game and somebody has a really cool skin and they suck balls at it and it really doesn't matter that they have that skin and I find it kind of disenchanting with the, with, or disenfranchising, yeah, with the uh, particular game that I'm playing. I don't really like that model, so I, I, not, I don't really necessarily like the idea of the current implementation of NFTs in games, but I am also fully aware that that is the direction we're moving. What do I mean by that, right? I do understand that we are moving into this new world of transact, like microtransactions and in-game purchases, etc., that do do this. And a better way to do it than it's currently implemented where it's centralized behind whatever developer that is doing it is that we could utilize NFTs that give the power sort of back to the player by some extent, meaning that at least at the end of the day, I suppose the players could create some sort of economy surrounding it, some ecosystem to buy, sell, and trade between themselves. And then it does become part a little bit of how much you participate in the game. So it could move it back into the proper direction. There's my argument against, there's my argument for, but of course my argument for is kind of like a defeatist standpoint at the end of the day. NFTs are not inclusive of all our, uh, of all our community and create a scenario of the haves and have nots. The speculative pricing investment mentality around NFTs takes the focus away from playing the game and encourages profiteering. I think that is true and can be a concern with NFTs in general, just like we were talking about before it turns into this ecosystem. And maybe there is an argument to where you say some games shouldn't have it at all. 
some games can, and then you work it out somewhere in between there. I think NFT ownership of the actual license to play the game is where I would really like to see some of this go, of course, which we think is inconsistent with the long-term joy and success of our players. We are also concerned that some third-party NFTs may not be reliable and may end up costing players who buy them. Some third-party NFT implementations are also entirely dependent on blockchain technology and may require an asset manager who might disappear without notice. There have also been instances where NFTs were sold at artificially or fraudulently inflated prices. We recognize that creation inside our game has intrinsic value, and we strive to provide a marketplace where those values can be recognized. Here's the problem. They're arguing against NFTs, but they do have, of course a they do have their own marketplace so when you read this and you see the contradictions the way i feel about it is that there wasn't enough research done before they released this obviously like they said it could be copy pasted blah 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 but it creates scarcity of the item okay guys okay as such, to ensure that Minecraft players have a safe and inclusive experience, blockchain technologies are not permitted to be integrated inside our Minecraft client and server applications, nor may they be utilized to create NFTs associated with any in-game content, including world skins, persona items, or other mods. This does mean, unfortunately, Neoxa mods, Neoxa community, if you're paying attention, you should probably bring this up in Discord. The links are down in the description. Let the devs know that this is going on because you don't want to get into a lawsuit with basically my, or Microsoft at this point. We will also be paying close attention to how blockchain technology evolves over time to ensure that the above principles are withheld and determine whether it will allow more secure experiences or other practical and inclusive applications in gaming. What does this line mean? This line means to me that if they see an opportunity to profit off of it themselves through their own centralized management systems, that they will implement NFTs. But as it sits right now, because they don't have a good handle on it, they don't want to allow other people to do it. However, we have no plans of implementing blockchain technology into Minecraft right now. We hope to have more to share with you soon. In the meantime, if you're interested, you can read their guidelines there. So I think I covered all of that while we were reading through it, but obviously the big thing here is that Minecraft is not going to allow blockchain technologies at all within their system, at least if they're third party, with kind of this caveat of if they research it more further down the line and determine it to, it to be beneficial, probably to their own pocketbook, if we're being completely honest, then they'll implement it. They have some glaring issues with the way they wrote this by contradicting themselves with the statement that it doesn't matter this an NFT because you can copy and paste it, but it does create scarcity. You can't do the same or both across those lines. It's a little silly. Uh, so I think they could have done a better job on that. But we have more NFT style news going on here. And it's very odd because basically this is going to be a two-parter and we'll segue out of it into the hack. But decentralized music streaming service Audius shifts balance of power, says Bank of America. Audius moves power, profits, control, and governance from record labels and centralized platforms to artists and fans, the report says. This is very odd. It's coming from Bank of America, first of all. So what did they have to gain out of this? Second of all, Audius was already proven to have some pretty bad security flaws that we're going to read about too. Audius decentralized music streaming platform provides artists with greater profits and increased control, Bank of America said in a research report Thursday. That sounds great to me. Audius launched its main net in October of 2020 with the aim of shifting the balance of power and profits from intermediaries such as record labels and centralized DSPs, digital service providers like Spotify, for example, to artists and platform users, the report says. The platform plans to distribute 90% of revenues to artists and 10% to node operators. So what are we looking at? Of course, we're looking at some sort of noting system, master noting, a form of staking, of course, but with processing built into it, probably to hold all of the music files, right? Resulting in a decentralized DSP that shifts power, profits, control, and governance from record labels and centralized DSPs to artists and fans, the note says. The streaming service said last week that it was offering a new feature for creators to monetize their content by allowing listeners to send tips to artists via its governance token audio. Bank of America said the music industry is ripe with uh, uh, for distribution. 
Still, Audius adoption trends and limited music offerings relative to larger DSPs are likely to limit short-term dis uh, disruption risk. However, disruption over the longer term is still possible. Competition is an issue as leading DSPs have built economic moats around their businesses by offering large music offerings through record labels and by leveraging personal data to improve the user experience, the note says. All very valid points. Smaller DSPs such as Audius are faced with a catch-22 scenario, a user ado adoption as user adoption is needed to push artists onto their platform, but it also needs artists to join to drive user adoption, it added. The bank notes that while Audius platform was attracted or has attracted mainstream artists, including Deadmau5, uh, Diplo, Skrillex, and Weezer, all pretty good uh, projects probably to, or artists to have hop on board, its usage growth growth has slowed since December of 2021. There are also potential legal risks related to Audius inability to remove music that infringes on copyright that should not be ignored, the note added. The platform said Saturday that it was aware of reports of unauthorized transfer of audio tokens from the community treasury after it was the victim of a hack. So let's get more information on the hack. This is very weird because basically this was posted at July, on July 25th, 2022, but I believe this was posted, or let's see, this was at 9.12 and this was at 6.30. Okay. So that, and I got confused because the hack actually was reported on before the actual deal here from Bank of America, but the Bank of America report sounds like it was before the hack. So how attackers stole around $1.1 million worth of tokens from decentralized music project Audius. The sophisticated exploit involved attackers passing a malicious governance proposal by exploiting smart contracts. About $1.1 million worth of Audius audio tokens were stolen over the weekend in a sophisticated attack that involved the project's governance forums. Audius, a tokenized music streaming project, relies on community voting and governance to make decisions. On Saturday, a malicious proposal saw attackers put a fake post and manipulate token votes to steal funds. Postmortem from this weekend's attack is on this blog here, so I guess we're going to go ahead and hand, head on over here because I think this will probably get us a little bit more information on what happened with the attack. So... On July 23rd, 2022, the Audius governance staking and delegation contracts on Ethereum main network compromised due to a bug in the contract initialization node or code that allowed repeated in, uh, invocations of the in, uh, initialized functions. The bug allowed an attacker to maliciously transfer 18 uh, million, I think, audio tokens held by the Audius governance contract, referred to as the community treasury, to a wallet of their control and modify dynamics of the voting system to illicitly change their staked audio amounts in the network. The set of contracts were audited by the Open Zeppelin team on August 20 or from August 25th, 2020, prior to deployment, and some additional changes were audited by Kudelski on October 27th, 2021. But unfortunately, this vulnerability was not caught in either case. The audience or Audius governance contracts utilize the Open Zeppelin proxy upgradeability pattern. Audius employs the Audius admin upgradeability proxy contract in order to permit proxy upgrades to the logic contracts of the Audius governance system, staking and delegation. In its implementation, the Audius admin upgradeability proxy uses storage slot zero for the address of the proxy admin. The proxy admin for the Audius protocol was set to the governance system address of address listed, which implements various checks and balances to prevent unauthorized use, voting procedures, time delays, and community run override process, etc. This caused a collision with Open Zeppelin's initializable contracts initialized in initializing boole uh, Boolean state, which are stored in slot zero, the first and second bytes, because the last byte of the proxy admin address is 0xac. In initialized was interpreted as truth, uh, a truthy value. 
Similarly, because the second byte of the proxy admin address is 0xab, initializing was also uh, interpreted as a truthy value. This caused the initializer modifier to always succeed. Here's the line of code. Furthermore, because initializing was already true, the call was not considered to be a top level call, which meant that both initializing and initialized were left unchanged. This allowed for repeated invocations of any function which used the initializer modifier. Documentation for this form of an attack vector and storage collision can be found here. Using this bug, the attacker was able to call the initializer method of deployed audius contracts that implement initializable and change the storage state uh, that is intended to be set, but, uh, set only once in initialization. Specifically, the attacker called initialize on the governance staking and delegate manager v2 contracts. Man, if you're going to go with a, a staking platform, like uh, I just, I think you got to build ground up because there's like, I, I wouldn't trust any, like they're obviously using third party open source stuff to run Audius. Proof of work probably would have been easier to secure with this attack. Uh, with this, the attacker was able to redefine voting on the Audius protocol and modify the governance contract's guardian address. Set the governance address of both the staking and delegate manager v2 contracts to that of a custom deployment of the Audius governance contract and abuse the Audius protocol by making an erroneous delegation of 10 million or way more than that. What was that? uh thousands millions billions 10 trillion audio to themselves in an attempt to pass governance vote they too mark a second erroneous delegation of 10 trillion or 10 billion wait thousands i'm 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 losing it today thousands <laughs> millions billions trillions 10 trillion yeah that's right 10 trillion god dang audio to themselves in an attempt to pass a governance vote, which did pass and transfer the funds. Transferring 18,564,497 audio tokens from the community treasury, and it's on Etherscan. Fortunately, the Audius team was able to de develop and apply a patch to quickly regain control of the protocol before the attacker could do more damage. So the impact is obviously the 18 million audio has been moved from the Audius community treasury to a wallet the attacker controlled internally to delegate manager and staking contracts. Two transactions were performed that delegated 10 trillion audio each. These changes were isolated to the internal state of the staking system. No new tokens were minted and didn't affect circulating token supply. Governance proposal 82 and 83 were executed on the governance system, but failed due to reason target contract address changed. These two contracts were opened by the Open Audio Foundation to update service versions on chain 3.62. Governance proposal 84 was created to transfer the entirety of the Audius community pool to the attacker's wallet, but did not pass quorum, so failed during execution. And governance proposal 85 was created to transfer the entirety of the Audius community pool to the attacker's wallet. And that one executed successfully. They have the timeline of events you can go into through here. It looks like it is built on uh, Ethereum as a token with staking enabled. Uh, so many points of failure within that if you're not, you know, building these systems from the ground up yourself and you do not have audits that catch this type of thing, it's going to happen. And, you know, it, it sucks too, because obviously, like, you want to see projects like this succeed, meaning, like, you want to see NFTs move in the, in the direction of empowering the individual, empowering the creators, obviously. You want to see blockchain help empower the creators, right? You want to see this type of thing being done uh, on the blockchain, but it needs to be done in a way that, that, you know, is bulletproof. And this is kind of why we go back to the Bitcoin maximalist idea, which is, 
you know, basically slow and low, you know, build these technologies out over time, take your time with them spinning up in October of 2020, and then trying to like deploy all of this by now. It's only a couple year timeline. We're pretty early in blockchain and you don't want to force things through unless you're fully uh, capable of, of protecting, you know, basically the investment of your users. And while there was no change to the circulating supply, et cetera, it does hurt the community fund, which handles all the governance. And that is kind of a big deal when we're talking about projects like this. So I'd like to hear your thoughts and opinions in the live chat, as well as the comment section below. And this is my favorite topic for today. Texas GOP aims to enshrine crypto in state's constitution. This is big, big news because what you have to understand, I think, is that, yes, we have the federal level to worry about to a certain extent, uh, basically banning cryptocurrencies, et cetera. But what this is doing is setting up basically Texas to be like a kind of a, 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 uh, kind of a crypto sanctuary state essentially within the U S in case there is, you know, some sort of regulation that prevents people from, uh, owning cryptocurrency. The Lone Star state is already an important crypto mining hub and Republican officials appear ready to try and build on that momentum. <sighs> We're going to say it again. Every single time we get something positive for cryptocurrency, it comes from the Republicans. Every time we get something negative, it comes from the Democrats. This is purely just in relation to cryptocurrency. And it's important to pay attention to this because you need to make sure you're paying attention to the individuals that are voting in favor of whatever you are trying to participate in. The Texas GOP platform calls for the state's Bill of Rights to include a clause allowing citizens to own, hold, and use whatever medium of exchange they choose, including digital currency. I really hope that applies to wallets and exchanges, all exchanges, non-KYC, and I hope it applies to, of course, privacy tokens and coins. The right of the people to own, hold, and use a mutually agreed upon medium of exchange, including cash, coin, bullion, digital currency, or scrip, when trading and contracting for goods and services, shall not be infringed, begins the clause of Texas Republicans would like to see added to the state's Bill of Rights. what I like to hear. No government shall prohibit or encumber the ownership or holding of any form or amount of money or other currency. The platform continues. Whoo! Yeah. Give it to me. All right. This is what I like to see. Explicit protections are needed for the natural right of Texas to keep an exchange and store their wealth in the mediums of exchange of their choice. Many Republican officials in the state are eager to make sure Texas builds on its status as a cryptocurrency hub, despite some lawmakers fears the industry could overburden an already strained power grid, which is obviously something people are talking about. Quote, I would like to see Texas become the center of the universe for Bitcoin and crypto. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz told 700 attendees at the Texas Blockchain Summit last October in Austin. On a national level, the policy arm of the U.S. Senate Republicans in April issued a paper on crypto, signaling the GOP is making gains towards a more unified stance on digital asset regulation. I just got to say, I mean, I this is all, I, look, the, like it's such a simple statement. Just, it's so good. The right of the people to own, hold, and use a mutually agreed upon medium of exchange. And then they said, including digital currency. No government shall prohibit or encumber the ownership or holding of any form or amount of money or other currency. Gotta love it, man. Nothing better than that. Ugh. Bitcoin drops even as Wall Street fear gauge indicates calm ahead of the Fed decision. So obviously... We had the bump in the cryptocurrency price all the way up, I think, to like 23,000. 
on Bitcoin and over 1600 on Ethereum. It's come back down over the weekend, kind of expected. You know, we see these boosts up on Thursdays. We see them come back down. All this is really telling me is that it doesn't appear to have as much of an effect, the Fed decisions, as I think we initially anticipated, because it seems to still do its own thing. If it was, we would see it going up, not going down, is what you would expect. I don't think the hawkish Fed trade has peaked, one observer said. Bitcoin fell even as Chicago Board of Options Exchange's volatility index, VIX, a measure known as Wall Street's fear gaze, showed the, an absence of investor anxiety ahead of the expected U.S. Federal Reserve rate increase on Wednesday. The top cryptocurrency mark, by market value changed hands at nearly 21900 down 3.5% in the past 24 hours. The price jumped 8.5% in, in the seven days through Saturday, the biggest weekly gain since March alongside gains in stock markets on speculation the Fed may become less hawkish in coming months. Fed, Fed funds futures indicate traders expect the central bank will raise interest rates by 75 basis points this week with a small likelihood of a 100 basis point move. A basis point is a one hundredth of a percentage point. Remember, though, we're way behind as it is. In the 70s, when this was a problem, you would try to basically raise the basis points to equate to whatever inflation is. We saw our inflation released at 9.1%. We're at like five something percent right now. As far as interest rates, that needs to actually go up something like 300 basis points. It needs another 300 basis points technically, right? So it's kind of weird because they would only raise it by 75 or by a hundred and then people consider that better, but it's kind of like ignoring the problem to a certain extent. The price drop is a surprise given the VIX index slipped to 22.41 in early Asian hours, its lowest level since April 21, indicating calm ahead of the Fed rate decision. And S&P 500 futures traded a little, traded little changed. Uh, Bitcoin tends to move in line with risk assets and closely follows uh, sentiment on Wall Street. Bitcoin's renewed weakness may be a signal the Fed is set to stick to its path of aggressive tightening. Many traders, including Mobius Capital Partners Mark Mobius, considered Bitcoin a leading indicator for stock markets. When the VIX spikes upward, it means investors are buying significantly more put options or bearish bets relative to calls or bullish bets. A rising VIX represents a higher level of concern, while a declining VIX indicates less fear and st stability. Investors could be in for a rude awakening should the Fed stick to a hawkish script. With the VIX at 23, it is currently at its lowest level this year, heading into the FOMC, which is the Federal Open Market Committee meeting, which I find bizarre. Michael Kramer, uh, founder of Mott Capital Management, wrote in a market update published on Sunday, adding that the positioning makes assets vulnerable to a potential Fed shock. This complacency may be happening because the market has convinced itself that the Fed is close to pivoting caving in and going back to its old ways of supporting asset prices, Kramer noted. This week's meeting may change the market's mind on how serious the Fed is regarding its battle against inflation and that it doesn't view the economy as weak or heading for a recession. Expectations that the Fed is close to opting for smaller hikes for the rest of the year and may eventually reverse course likely stem from the signs inflation has peaked and concerns the economy could soon dip into a recession. The market seems to be discounting that the Fed will blink in the face of ba a bad economic data, and we don't know that it will. All signaling so far has stressed their focus on inflation, and it's likely that we will, we will see continued determination until either inflation has showed definitive signs of peaking or the economy is in a lot worse shape. Noel Aikson, head of market insights at Genesis Global Trading said, the Fed has pledged not to let up uh, its policy tightening until inflation moves materially, uh, I can pronounce words, lower towards its 2% annual target. 
The central bank's preferred measure of inflation, the core personal consumption ex uh, expenditure, core PCE price index, came in at 6.3% for May. Any Fed pivot may also be contingent on a marked decline in the consumer price index, which includes the volatile food and energy component and affects the spending habits of Americans. In June, the CPI soared 9.1% from a year earlier, a 40-year high. Although the news on renewed wheat shipments and prices back to pre-invasion levels will help, as will continue downward moves on other commodities, the price increases in the CPI and PCE so far have been broad-based, which hints at stickiness, Aikson said, referring to food exports from Ukraine and its war with Russia. And while cracks are appearing in the housing sector, the broader economy looks resilient thanks to strong jobs and wage growth. I'm not seeing that, though. I'm hearing jobs are getting more scarce. When it was last reported on June 30th, the Kansas City Labor Market Conditions Index was at its highest since the late 1990s. The Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker reached its highest since 1997 at the end of June. With this inflation, you would really hope that wages are at its highest, but they aren't keeping up with inflation. The data provides the Fed with room to continue tightening, meaning the so-called hawkish Fed trade, which involves buying dollars and selling risk assets, could continue to royal markets, including cryptocurrencies. I don't think the hawkish Fed trade has peaked, Aikson told Coindesk. Since March, the Fed has raised borrowing costs by 150 basis points, lifting the benchmark interest to the 1.5 to 1.75% range. Although the hawkish trade appears to have legs, other factors may ensure limited downside in crypto. The narrative decoupling is likely to become more apparent as global economic fractures widen, Aikson said. And there's also the Ethereum merge trade, the DeFi trade, and other signs of progress to further distance crypto market performance from stock market performance in coming months. You know, the decoupling is something that's really interesting, but not the decoupling of cryptocurrencies from the themselves, like Ethereum from Bitcoin. But we just saw that this is kind of the move that, that, that we are taking, right? This is the path we are going down. Texas GOP aiming to enshrine crypto in state's constitution. What does that mean? That means that it's a lot more likely that people just start transacting directly with cryptocurrency. I'll give you this amount of Bitcoin for this service or this product. I will no longer transact in the fiat currency or in the US dollar. I will transact in cryptocurrency directly within the state and no longer have to pull out of cryptocurrency. What does that mean? That means that you have a lot less selling pressure on cryptocurrency because I don't need to sell the cryptocurrency to get the services and goods that I need provided to me, which will decouple naturally cryptocurrency from the stock market and US dollar traded assets, essentially. David, head of institutional research at Coinbase Global, said the bullish positioning in the dollar appears overdone and could reverse depending on what the Fed signals later this week. A recently published Bank of America fund manager survey cited long U.S. dollar, long oil, and short stocks as crowded trades. Such extreme risk-off or bearish positioning often portends to a trend of uh, reversal higher. There we go. I can do that. Several indicators have flashed signs of a bear market bottom recently in Bitcoin. That said, according to, to Duong or David, a bull revival will take time. But even though the worst for crypto is probably over, I think we still need a few more months before things stabilize, before digital assets like Bitcoin can start to recover in earnest, he said. Now, I'm just going to say, if we see the decoupling... And we see, I don't, here's the deal. Because everybody always wants to ask, this is my opinion, it's not financial advice. I don't see a recovery of the crypto market from the current kind of $18,000 to $22,000 marks until, of course, the next halving in 2024. And that is still kind of where I sit and stand. That being said, of course, if we do see more and more states hop on board with Texas here. We start seeing more services that allow for people to trade uh, directly with cryptocurrency for products and services. 
that could completely shift this entire game into a different direction. We did forget we do have a new miner release and it is from BZ Miner three days ago. And basically here's the lowdown on that. This is version 10.0 and the new coin is Woodcoin. So Woodcoin CPU op optimization as well for set to one for pre-processing on a CPU, which is interesting. The, for the dual mining, they fixed low hash rate for light hash rate cards. They removed empty package errors for the dual mining, and they also fixed invalid Ethereum shares on some pools. And for Ixian, they fixed rejected share issues, and for Ixian, they fixed HTTPS issues. Zill, they fixed mining Zill window with nice hash uh, Ethereum or ETH, and they added efficiency to HTTP API status. They changed batch files for two miners to use ETH proxy instead of ETH stratum. And they fixed HTTP GUI log console not showing all logs. They fixed Windows batch files for running as admin. They disabled Caspa dev team fee by default. That's nice. They fixed reboot after watchdog restarts typo in config.txt and they fixed hide unused devices from config.txt file. So big update from BZ Miner, very relevant one for Caspa removing that dev fee by default. Let's get into mining profitability in the state of my farm right after a word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Crypto.com. Crypto.com is my go-to centralized exchange for liquidating my crypto assets. With their Crypto.com Visa debit card, I can load up my mined Ethereum to pay for power and other operating costs quickly while earning up to 8% cash back. In addition to the Visa debit card, there are additional fiat options including wire transfers to easily receive your profits. Crypto.com also offers additional services including trading and even staking to earn additional revenue revenue on your investments. Join 10 million plus users buying and selling 100 plus cryptocurrencies at true cost by using my affiliate link in the description for a $25 funding bonus or enter referral code SOAT at sign up for the same bonus. Remember, cryptocurrency investment comes with significant risks, so do your own research. Hmm, and welcome back everybody. So this week, like I said, I stayed at the farm pretty much all weekend and check out this beauty of a farm. I gotta love it, man. We got 16 workers online. We're in Octo Miners. We've had zero errors since yesterday when I completed it. Oh my God. It's amazing. It feels so good. We're up to 5.7 giga hash a second on Ethereum right now. And Neoxa, I have 62.8 mega hash a second. Those are running on 1063 gigabytes because why not get some Neoxa while we're out there, even though we're going to have, we have the really bad news from Minecraft today, unfortunately, but that's okay. They still got rust and other projects they're working on. Uh, we do have this S10 down here, which I'm still testing. I'm going to go do one more test on it this week. Then we'll have the review and we will be giving it away on sonofatech.locals.com. So if you're interested in that, let me know. It's on like its third level at 20 terahash a second. It can go up to 23 terahash a second. We'll discuss that in the review. A lot of that has to do with the heat in my particular farm, but I'm feeling pretty good. Now, all of these little ones, that was me swapping over to Hive, uh, Hive on pool because, well, uh, the profitability on crazy pool for yesterday was really, 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 really bad, right? Like only $78 for the last three days, 260. I should be making a lot more, uh, than we're making on it. So that is why we pulled out you know, on, of course, crazy pool for now. I'm going for a more steady income stream, but we also will be basically taking a lot of stuff and moving it over to solo mining and adjusting some stuff depending on the temperatures. Lots of logs coming out though, because we did get the entire farm moved over. So if you're enjoying 
the rebuild vlogs. Don't worry, more coming. The next one will be tonight at 6 p.m. Central Time. Let's get into what to mine, though, and correct, of course, all of the numbers here for uh, the hash rates. So Zell hash 110, Kapow 60, Progpow 60, Fero Proof of Work 60. Let's calculate that out. That puts Neoxa in first place at 273 a day in revenue and $1.94 a day after power. Ethereum at 270 a day in revenue and $1.93 a day after power. Ravencoin 264 a day in revenue and $1.85 a day after power. Cero 251 a day in revenue and $1.72 a day after power. Firo 218 a day in revenue and $1.43 a day after power. Conflux 216 a day in revenue and $1.36 a day after power. Ethereum Classic 209 a day in revenue and $1.33 a day after power. Flux $1.79 in revenue and $1.09 in after power. And Ergo $1.78 a day in revenue and $1.16 a day after power. Mining pool stats. Let's see if we've had any big changes in hash rates. On Bitcoin, it's at 224 exit hash a second. So over the weekend, some more hash rate came online. Let's see if we see similar on Ethereum which has seen a price improvement. And there was one weird spike here, apparently to over a petahash. Maybe that was Bitmain te testing their E9s before they ship them out. <laughs> and then now it's sitting around 950 terahash a second. So it is up. Ethereum Classic is at 26 terahash a second. No changes. Let's go ahead and look at Neoxa because obviously that's been going up. 227 uh, giga hash a second, not really that high. Ravencoin at 2.16 tera hash a second. And let's check Flux, which is at one mega solution a second right now. And Ergo, which is at 10 tera hash a second right now. So there is pretty much all of that. We do have a decline again in difficulty on Ergo. Hopefully that remains. Let's get into mining pool profitability for the last 90 days. Ether mine in first, mining pool up in second, F2 pool in third. For the last 60 days, ZET in first, Ether mine in second, mining pool hub in third. For the last 30 days, mining pool hub in first, F2 pool in second, nano pool in third. For the last 21 days, Mining Pool Hub in first, F2 Pool in second, Ether Mine in third. For the last 14 days, Mining Pool Hub in first, F2 Pool in second, Nano Pool in third. For the last seven days, Nano Pool in first, Mining Pool Hub in second, F2 Pool in third. For the last three days, ZET in first, Nano Pool in second, Mining Pool Hub in third. And for the last day, ZET in first, Nano Pool in second, Mining Pool Hub in third. ASIC. Mining profitability, as always, hopping in here. We have the Jazzminer X4 uh, at the top. But other than that, the Antminer L7 still kind of holding. The Nyan coin still holding, surprisingly, over the weekend and staying the most profitable on script, which is pretty funny. The KD6 has dropped to 15.11 a day after power. And the Gold Shell HS3 is at 12.06 a day after power. Scrolling down some more, if we take a look at the S19 Pro, it's at 4.62 a day, which is a little bit up over the weekend. Let's get into questions and answers. Remember, Super Chats are never required, always appreciated first to be answered. Tagging at son of a tech will highlight the beginning of the message orange, making it easier for me to read. If you do not tag me, I probably will not answer. Super chat stickers are the best for the algorithm, or at least that's what I've been told by YouTube. I don't know if that's necessarily true. And to support me best uh, directly, if you wish to, sonofatech.locals.com is where you can do that. And I get the most amount of money because they send me the most compared to all the other platforms. Uh, Leonardo says, as some of a tech when Mojang says it, uh, it can be copy and paste. They are referring to how original, uh, ideology of the internet worked in the two thousands info and images were free and could simply be copied and pasted. Well, I mean, you can still do that to, to this day. The contradiction that they have in their article means that it, it is the problem that I'm pointing out as far as that goes, where they say it creates an artificial, 
uh, an artificial scarcity, but then they're also saying it doesn't matter because you can just copy and paste it. They need to be consistent in their arguments. Simon says, afternoon, son of a tech. Hope you're doing well. How's it going, Simon? Nathan says, at son of a tech, how often do thermal paths need to be changed on the 3070 and the 3080? Uh, 10 gigabyte. It really depends on which manufacturer you're going with, right? And the environment in which you are in. Why do I say these things? Well, because first of all, the thermal paste and the thermal pads, like consistency can be different across brands, right? So if they're softer with more oil in them, they typically tend to last a little bit longer. They'll get leaky, but they'll last longer because obviously there's more in there. But if you have a really humid uh, area, they may last longer. If it's really dry, they may be shorter. If the temperature's hotter, obviously they'll wear out quicker. So there's all of these other factors that go into it. The best plan is to just monitor your cards. And as you start to see hash rates drop on them or thermal throttling being uh, starting to take place, then you know that it's time to replace it on that particular GPU. There's no blanket statement of replace your pads and thermal paste every year on a RTX 3080 10 gigabyte. Like that's not something that we could ever determine. Um, and then when you replace your pads, there is like basically the understanding of the different types of pads and which ones are going to last longer versus, you know, how much, how much heat they're going to dissipate. For example, if you do like a GLID GC extreme thermal pads or GC extreme thermal paste as well, uh, you'll notice that they, uh, break down a lot quicker. They have a very good uh, thermal capacity and they'll, they'll dissipate the heat very, very well initially, but they'll wear out a lot quicker. So as opposed to maybe replacing it every year, you're replacing it every six months if you use something like that. Um, if you use something that maybe doesn't dissipate as good, but lasts longer, you know, has a different consistency, doesn't dry out as much, then you're going to have a better chance at like replacing it later on down the line. So all of these things are going to have to be tested also though, like in your particular environment. Simon says, ask Simon Tech, giveaways worldwide. Giveaways will be in the US for anything that we're shipping. All of the NFT giveaways, et cetera, will be obviously worldwide because we can do that, but I can't afford shipping. I'm trying to eat over here. Babblefish says, ask Simon Tech, how's the ventilation project coming? Ventilation should be in hopefully this week, but I haven't gotten word on the date when they're coming out. Dennis says, ask Simon Tech, Bobcat minor antenna review your best antenna. Um, I have an antenna. I paid two hundred fifty dollars for it, and it doesn't really help. I mean, it helps, but it like doesn't help the profitability. It's pretty much a bust. Fun vampire, thank you for the four ninety nine super chat sticker. Ted Park, thanks for the five dollars Canadian. Says as Sanvitek. Now that you have your cards and your Octa miners, what comments can you make about how they perform? Well, um, they perform well. I mean, like as far as like the Octa miners go across the board, easiest to build in, least amount of issues. We had 12 units of the 12 units. We had one bad SSD and we had one bad temperature sensor. So, I mean, across the board, like not bad for the batch that we got. And it really is plug and play. You know, you take it apart, you slap the cards in, you plug in the power, you plug it into the wall, it boots up, you type in the rig ID and the password. And it's off to the races. Um, all of them have been like, usually you guys see my farm all the time. Usually, you know, we'd go to my workers page after a night and there'd be red errors all over the place. And there's, there's none. And like, if we look at the temperatures, it's not like the temperatures changed, right? Our intake is still 44 degrees Celsius. So um, it's, you know, it's a relief. It really is. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you get what you pay for uh, from the perspective of like how they, ha how they do have a price premium and you get a lot of monitoring on them. They're extremely stable. And even when a card is acting finicky, you can kind of just see that it either drops off the rig or it changes, you know, the, the hash rate goes down, but the whole system doesn't go down with it. I've had a lot of other systems where, just one card that's finicky will hurt everything else, right? 
So I like him a lot. Daniel Ring says he bought a 3070 Ti for $555 yesterday. Um, yeah, I mean, the current current market sounds pretty good. Knowledge is Power says, ask Sam Tech, what's a good price point for the 3060 Ti? What, $400 for the FE? I wouldn't spend more than $400. Uh, Golden Goose says, ask Sam Tech, one of my mining rigs is stable, but will re restart randomly every 12 hours or so. Do you have any advice? Uh, well, you got to figure out what's not stable because something isn't stable. You can't say something is stable, but it restarts every 12 hours. If you said that and you were a data, a data center engineer, you'd get fired. There's something wrong. You need to figure out what's wrong. Um, you need to check your memory temperatures, your overclocks, all of that. Obviously, like the easiest thing to do is to remove your overclocks and see if it runs more than 12 hours. That's like the first place where I start, that sort of thing. Simon H says, ask Simon Tech, we'll just watch the channel. You're UK, uh, UK based. Well, we have NFTs and we have over a thousand dollars worth of crypto we're giving out as well on some of the tech.locals.com. So there's that. Black Cat Crypto says, at Simon Tech, you seem much more relaxed now that everything is in the Octo Miners. It does make life a little bit easier. I do have a lot of other issues to deal with, including, but not limited to, the depression of YouTube and the decreasing CPMs along with the decreasing views and subscriber counts. I have my power company raking me over the coals to get more money out of me. Don't worry. All the stress is still there, but we'll talk about all that uh, in some videos as I get them out. Rad CPU man says, at son of a tech, if I win the ant miner, you'll road trip down and get it from me. Yeah, save me the... <laughs> get some food well good luck i'm excited to give it away i'm excited to get the review out too i was hoping to hit a block on bitcoin cash before but it doesn't look like we're going to it is what it is uh knowledge is power says ask time tech are you more excited about flux or ergo not seeking financial advice of course um so i think that they're completely separate like they're not um the same so I feel like I can be equally excited about both that being said from a principled standpoint I would trust ergo way more than flux flux has a C level they are centralized to an extent and they've even talked about how they're centralized and how they needed to be centralized to basically uh, raise funds and, and develop faster I get that point of view but also if one piece of if one piece of a project is centralized, it does mean inevitably everything there is centralized. Um, I think Ergo does a better job from a decentralization and a principled standpoint, so I would lean towards Ergo uh, for the long term. But Flux is technology and basically running virtual private servers on the blockchain is way ahead of anything else that's currently out surrounding web three, the fun vampire for four ninety nine super chat chat sticker. Thank you. Good sir. Says keep it up with the little dude lifting some weights. Oh, great one says that's I'm a tech. Are you excited for the landscape after the merge? Even if it means turning rigs off. Yeah. I want this to be over. I want to see what's going to happen to ETH. I want to see if ETH can survive this. I really, really do. Um, because I have a lot of questions about how it impacts the rest of the crypto market. It's kind of like also if you're a proof of work guy, you kind of want to get that. I told you so, uh, specifically surrounding the, the, uh, the withdrawals not being enabled. I want to be like, Oh, finally, everybody sees that that was a problem. Thank goodness. And that scalability didn't apply. Like there are these things that are like technical that the retail market doesn't realize that's going to affect them. And it's very frustrating that that is not considered at all. 
Instead, they're busy throwing illegal parties in the catacombs in Paris. Dennis says, Ask Time of Tech, is staking flux a good idea? I would never uh, put everything into a single coin for my revenue generation. Um, if you have the money to lose and that's what you want to do, you know, that's your, that's your decision. Uh, the reason I do cryptocurrency mining, specifically GPUs, is it offers me the most versatility out of anything else, right? Even compared to ASICs. Um, so basically I would put staking flux on the level of buying an ASIC miner that can only mine one coin. Village BC says, ask some attack, do you get approached to, um, like, yeah, to prop up new and unknown coins? I get approached, I used to in the bull run a lot, Village. And we've always said, you know, like, I don't, um, we don't take coin sponsorships um, or anything along those lines, even though they are very obviously financially enticing. Um, back in the bull run, you know, you'd get offers for 10000 and then you would see, you know, other YouTubers release the video and I just sit there shaking my head like, ah, cause it is that like, we've talked about this problem. I've talked about it a lot. And, um, from my perspective, you know, like I take, I take this job, what I do here and I call it a job. I take it very seriously, uh, because it it's very important to try to do things as ethically and responsibly as possible. And if you are going to be pre buying a coin and working some deal out to also get paid in that coin and then pumping that coin, I think that there are a lot of ethical concerns there. Moradolf game says, ask time of tech. Do you have light hash rate cards? Yes, I do have light hash rate cards. Super Vilsi says, "As some of a tech, has there been any news about Flux useful proof of uh, proof of work, proof of useful work? Not yet. I mean, they released Titan nodes, which was proof of useful staking. It's kind of a good marketing ploy." Daniel Ring says, "As some of a tech, I mined a bunch of Nyan coin over the weekend. However, getting it cashed out was kind of a circus. I'm sure it was, dude. I'm sure it was." Uh, Retro Mike Crypto says, ask some tech thoughts on what if Flux has price appreciation? Currently, it's $3 a Flux per month to run a server or a service. Um, I feel like if it goes above $3 a coin, they won't be able to compete with other VPSs. And that is obviously a concern, but it, it depends on the, si the size. I haven't checked the pricing on it. I'll check a pricing and I'll try to do an update on that because we talked about that before, right? Um, if I didn't realize that they upped it to three flux a month, the, how many cores and how much uh, CPU is that though too? Is that just like a single core, three instances and like, uh, not much memory or, or what Joe Blow says, ask time of tech, what kind of router do you use at your farm? Uh, I don't answer those questions, bro. Village BC says, ask time of tech. I was uh, meaning to imply if you were taking them. Um, just curious how much, be uh, behind the scenes shilling is being pushed. If you are comfortable sharing, uh, like I said, it was all in the bull run. I get a couple here and there now but not near as much. I kind of like the bear market from the YouTuber perspective as far as my inbox is not flooded with that stuff. But, you know, it was multiple daily when we were in the bull run. So, you know, I mean, hundreds of thousands probably over the whole bull run or over the existence of the channel. A lot of them get straight sent straight to spam. Uh, R Alpha says, ask Simon Tech what to buy for $250 of Vega 64 or 5700 XT. Thanks for all the work. Um, obviously not financial advice, but the Vega 64, while pretty awesome with the HBM and everything, does have a lot of weird finicky issues and the memory modules do die. You're probably safer with the 5700 XT, um, but you'll get more hash out of the 64.
but I would do the 5700 XT. The 64 was a pretty weird card. Is 2385 USD good for an S19 ter 90 tera hash? I think that is a good pricing for it right now. Yeah. Oh, great one says, Asamatech, do you have a small hints on finding lesser known proof of work cryptos? No, I don't. It's really hard. You got to get into communities and talk to devs and keep bouncing around. Samuel says, Asamatech, do you have an Octo Miner coupon yet? No, we do not. Um, I think I got email to, or I got a message today that that is getting set up. I think we'll be having one run tonight at 6 p.m. is what it looks like. A promo. So check the video tonight. <sighs> Gandalf Gray says, As I'm a tech, what is the difference between regular DeFi staking and staking Flux on a Titan node? When you stake on Nexo, it's essentially the same with shorter lockup periods. Well, there's a, first of all, like, well, DeFi. Okay. Liquidity pools aren't staking. So let's make sure that's clear. So a liquidity pool, like a DeFi service, let's say like Uniswap, something like that. You're taking 50% of one coin, 50% of the other, locking it up. And the people are using that to trade the currency back and forth. So you can theoretically pull that out whenever, and it just reduces the amount of volume of that pairing. Okay. Um, then there is staking to process transactions which is also a little bit different right so if you're on a layer one staking protocol staking traditionally has meant that you are essentially putting up coin to process transactions and getting a reward a block reward okay so that's going to be a little bit different then there's like the staking of tokens um on different networks to usually help the uh, whoever the developer of those networks are to generate capital. So there and there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance in all of these different things. As far as a Titan node goes, what is happening there is there's a basically, for lack of a better term, just think of it like this: you're putting in flux into a smart contract that is licensing that out to someone that then spins up a node so then there's a master node that's running but you're only running a portion of it um so it's still not necessary because master noting and staking are a little bit different um because a node is going to process the transactions on the hardware as well as provide some other sort of service. So the Titan nodes are providing the funds to run nodes that are then processing the services for the Flux blockchain. Village BC says, Ask Simon Tech, have you messed with KuCoin trading bots at all? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I've messed with Prime XBT until. Uh, I was knocked out of the uh, geographical location. EJ says, how's Hive on pool? I just started. I'll let you know. We'll see you tomorrow. Tactics, good to see you back in chat. Says, ask Simon Tech morning. Uh, great one. Uh, indeed, I think ETH will crash and where the miners go will be the new playground, new stomping ground, so to speak. Where is our new home? Um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily sure that that is true. I'm not necessarily sure that I agree just because of the first mover advantage and the amount of stuff built on ETH. If we're talking about ETH taking a crash though, and then devs moving somewhere, they're going to go somewhere that's probably, uh, you know, predictable and easy to migrate to, which would be Ethereum classic. So that would be the new playground for all your typical stuff. I'm not sure I see that happening. I think in the long term, Ergo makes a lot of sense, though, from a DeFi perspective, all that. 
John says, as some attack, do you mind me asking are you 3% pooling or $3 per rig in Hive? I have to recalculate now that we've combined everything. I think it's going to be the $3 per rig. Because we decrease the amount of um, actual rigs. Joe says, ask Samvitek suggestions on a solid router that doesn't drop connection and can handle lots of rigs then. Uh, you probably want to do, well, it'll, it'll, let's see. So anytime you're looking at it, you would check the amount, you know, the size of the processor within the router itself. The other alternative to that is building your own with like a server uh, and um, utilizing something like PFSense. Uh, some of the routers I like a lot are flash routers because you can do a at router level um, at router level VPN. See if I can get that link for you. Uh, I don't have one from my channel apparently right now. I think level one text talks about it though. Uh, 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 if I looked at mining eCash, no, I haven't. Gandalf Gray says, Ask Amatech, thanks for the clarity. Anytime. Uh, Tactics says, Ask Amatech, are there more miners or traders, investors? I bet the market follows the miners. What percentage of the crypto community are miners? We talked about this at the beginning of the show, though. The selling pressure that miners create on smaller projects, like we saw with uh, Aneta like we've even seen with Bitcoin and the selling pressure there and like we saw with Firo. You know, Firo has a valid argument there if we look at it objectively. The route, so, the, okay. So if you were going to use like a, um, I mean, you obviously there's a, there are firewalls built into some routers. You can have a separate firewall though, that would act as your, uh, not well. Yeah. You could get like a sonic wall as well, but you could also do your routing through a sonic wall. A lot of people like the ubiquity, yeah. Flash routers make it really, really easy. I don't know if I have my... Uh, promo code, but they make it really easy to basically put a at router level VPN in. All right, boys, that's going to call it for me today. Be sure to hit the like, comment, subscribe, and notification bell down below so you're notified when we release videos and go live on the channel. We'll have another vlog out tonight at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we should be seeing clips come back to the channel. The, uh, you know, Metal Miner, unfortunately, was sick uh, over the past week, so give out well wishes to Mr. Metal Miner, who does the clipping for me on the channel. And I will see you guys next Tuesday.